Oh, oh my goodness, we're live. We are. It yeah. said we were. It says now we've been live for twenty seconds, but I just pushed the button like three I seconds take, I ago. I take all that back then. I don't I know. That, I yeah. you know that's we're gonna have to check the tape there <laughs> and uh, possibly do some erasing. Yeah. <laughs> Christopher Anderson calling Chris Anderson in London. How are you? I'm doing fine here in uh, Tier Four. Tier Four, London. you're locked down, baby. We are locked down. How are and you in Chicago? We are. Uh, we're doing good in Chicago, and uh, we've been locked down. So uh, you know, not exactly the same, but pretty, pretty similar. Yeah. Um, so we'll wait a moment for people to join us. Uh, please post something to s let us know that you're here, like uh, Marie has already done. And we're here talking about history every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook and YouTube pages. And all of our broadcasts are also archived on the History Happy Hour webpage. And Chris, I was just looking at the History Happy Hour webpage. You were. I know. Well, what did you find there? I, I found that we have just done a shitload of shows. <laughs> 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 yeah. I I started going through this and I was like, oh, I I can't even remember all these shows. And this is just the first page of shows. You know, when you duped me into this, you said we were only going to do it for a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Look, and here we go. Here's page two. We go oh back. God. Oh, the last zero fighter. That was excellent. Yeah. Uh, Hamilton versus Burr. You had some problems on that show. Yeah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> But I just uh, was really uh, just thinking uh, how what an amazing 40 weeks it's been doing the show and, and how fun it's been and um, and just kind of reliving that a little bit today before we came on the air. We should have pandemics more often. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no? No, I no, okay. think not. I think that's oh, okay. a negatory there. I think we can uh, we can skip the pandemics. Uh, I think one every hundred years. I think we got that covered. Yeah. Seems about right. I think um, you're probably right. So I think that we've hit a, uh, a point here, Chris, where we can engage in that thing we engage in. Brrr. Boom. The bar is open. The bar is open. Um, so welcome everybody and, and happy week before Christmas to everyone yes. and we'll perhaps say that again at, at the end and wish you a Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah and, and uh, happy secular holiday, whatever it takes. Whatever it is. Uh, our guest today is Kate Warren, uh, author and uh, uh, documentary producer and I'll introduce her in a moment but I kind of want to talk about her book first, the book she's written which is entitled uh, an American Uprising in Second World War England. And this book centers on something that happened in September 1943 in a small town in Cornwall in the UK. And on this particular night, uh, racial tensions between black and white American soldiers exploded and African American soldiers opened fire in the town square, hitting some white MPs, military police. And this incident and the subsequent uh, court-martial uh, of, of I, a bunch of African-American soldiers is the centerpiece of Kate's book. And I say centerpiece because the book also encompasses a wider look at racial tensions among American soldiers in World War II England and the reactions and involvement of British civilians and the British government. So it's a pretty wide-ranging subject. And uh, our guest today, let's see if I can push enough buttons to bring her on the screen, um, uh, Kate hey. Warren, is a journalist who has produced critically acclaimed 20th century history programs for Channel 4, Channel 5, and the BBC, which are all very well-respected networks in Britain. Kate, welcome to History Happy Hour, the pinnacle of your career so far. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. And what Thank are you. you drinking today, Kate? So today I'm having a gin and tonic. Oh, Excellent well move. Well played, yes, With yes. cucumber for a change. Oh, oh very cucumber, good. very good. Christopher, what about you? I don't know why I'm calling you Christopher today. Uh, Spitfire. Spitfire. It's a, it's, a, it's a Sunday, in other words. Yeah. <laughs> As opposed to a Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I have an Abbe left here in my, uh -huh. my PsyOps glass, you know, oh, persuade, yeah. influence, and change. Ah, I see. 
Kate, uh, uh, now that we've, you know, inducted you, you've gone through the History Happy Hour initiation, uh, how did you come across the story that you tell in your book, and why did you think it was an important story to tell? So I came across this story through my family, my dad, um, who is Cornish. He was actually with his family in London for the war, but in 1948 they moved back to Launceston. And the talk of the town then was about this amazing shootout that kind of captured the imagination of the town. Um, but nobody really knew what happened to it. And they didn't know what happened to the soldiers afterwards. They just knew there'd been a lot of shooting and there was a lot of attention and then it kind of went away. And looking at it, the timing of it, it was September 1943. The court martial happened a few weeks later in October and things just kind of built and built. And then obviously the Second World War was unfolding and things moved on and it kind of got lost in time. So it's a story my dad has told me, myself and my three siblings. We've grown up knowing about it. His family still lived in Launceston. So every year we'd go to Launceston and see our family members and we'd go to the square. And it's just something we, there's always been in our family, but nobody really knew what happened. And I, in my later life, I started to make documentaries and I kind of worked out how to do a timeline and put things together. My husband and I managed to take a gap year and we spent time in America in 2004 slash five. And the two things kind of came together and I wanted to find out about this story. And I spoke to a very brilliant historian called Graham Smith, who's written about the tension between African-American soldiers and American soldiers based over here and then the reaction in Britain. And I see, he said to me, I think you should get the court martial. So in 2005, I put in a freedom of information request and got the court martial transcript. And it came through my door maybe a year after I'd requested it. And just turning the first page, it was like opening a script. It was this amazing, heavy, heavy, big document just outlining this story and it unfolded in front of my eyes and it's timeless it's real the dialogue is there and I just thought god I've got to find out more about it and I found out why people didn't know about this story and I kind of approached it as a documentary maker would I went and did my timeline I went to the British Library I went to the newspaper library I found out what was going on and then the story actually became much bigger than even my dad had told he just he just said it was the talk of the town it was still the talk of the town really and there are people in Launceston of a certain generation who have always wondered what happened to these soldiers who they rather liked and they wanted to know what happened to them so it's a family story that I kind of use my experience in making documentaries to to kind of investigate okay it's okay um how is it that these African Americans found themselves in your family's hometown and Kind of what were they doing there and, and why were they separate from all the other American soldiers that were there? So this this was the this was a big surprise. I mean, I didn't know much about the American army that came here to trial and train for D-Day, but it was segregated. And that meant that when people joined up, they were given roles according to their race, pretty much. And the services of supply, which is where most African American soldiers found themselves. So my guys, the 581st Ordnance Ammunition Company, were in Launceston. They were actually building depots, ammo depots, um, to help supply the D-Day chain. And they were based in Launceston. And alongside them, um, you could almost see it, was the, the white camp. And that had soldiers from the 29th Infantry Division. So they were cheek by jowl. They lived together, but it was a very separate existence and it was kind of never the twain uh, would meet. And that was what I found really surprising when I was researching the story is that everybody who has memories of the American GIs who came to Britain and they made a huge impression. Everyone remembers this racial tension. They have stories, you know, handed down through their parents or their grandparents of the tension when the two um soldiers met and it kind of it was very difficult to navigate this segregation the british government found itself um in a, in a tricky position 
Um, and the eventual sort of compromise was that pubs would be open to white soldiers on one day and then black soldiers on another day. Or towns, there would be um, in Bath, where I are, there's a, um, a village, a lovely village called Southstoke, and that's where the black soldiers were based and then the white soldiers had Bath. So there was this kind of separation. This surprised me, I didn't know anything about that, but then people of a certain generation are completely au fait with this and they know that this was, this was how the American army operated. Right. The, uh, did you ever follow No, this? no. I, no? Well, okay. The floor so, is yours. Uh, wow. Uh, well, you, uh, you quote in the, in the front piece of your book, you quote a, uh, uh, an African-American journalist, Roy Otley, mm. Uh, and he says the American race problem is being transplanted to British soil, sometimes with a venom unknown in the United States. What, is, what does he mean and why would that be true? I think what he meant was in Britain there was no color bar. Um, although, you know, ruling this empire on which the sun never set, there are very few people of color living in the country at this time. Um, and the British people didn't make a difference. They, the women, would date black soldiers, they date white soldiers, so they didn't see a difference. And I think that came as a shock to some of the American soldiers, and they wrote home in the censored letters that I've read, you know, some really pretty horrible comments. It, it was something that they didn't like, and I think that maybe provoked reactions in Britain. I mean, you, you go through, and I went through um, a lot of documents through mass observation. Um, they were reported by the British government. They were monitoring the British reaction to the colour bar. And I think it just provoked this reaction in American soldiers because they hadn't seen it. I think the mixed relationships were banned in the majority of American states at the time, and yet it was being flaunted in front of some of these soldiers' faces, and they didn't like it. So it kind of came together and also Launceston, the, the mutiny happened right at the middle, it was kind of a groundswell, it was this rising tension, it happened in America, there were in, 90, in that summer of 1943, one of the writers called it that long bloody hot summer because there were urban riots, people were dying on the streets um, because of this racial tension and that came over inevitably in the waves of servicemen as they crossed the Atlantic and it started happening here. And for me, um, I live just outside Bath and there's some beautiful little villages and towns around me. And these are some of the towns that are written about at having these stand down rousy showdowns between black and white soldiers. And it seems to me from all the evidence that I've been looking at just researching Launceston, the British had a real sympathy for the African-American soldiers. They couldn't really believe what they were seeing. They were befuddled, they were confused. And then actually, you hear these very British voices from the sidelines saying, that's not democracy, they're as good as them. They've come over to fight. They should be allowed to go to the pub. You can hear these very British voices sort of protesting about the way and the difference in the way that they were treated by, a my, and it, to be fair, it was a minority of soldiers, but it was very um, evident for the people here. And, and what's been quite interesting, I've been talking um, about my book uh, in festivals such as Launceston, and a lot of people have got in touch with me afterwards and giving their own anecdotes, their own personal recollections of what it was when the Americans came to this country. And they were welcomed, you know, as heroes, but then there was this other side that I think has been slightly forgotten about in history. And I think it's time that we kind of looked at that again with fresh eyes. I think we can, we, we've got time and we've got the evidence now to look at that and just give us a fresh look at, at what it was like. So, so Kate, now leading up, well, well, kind of two parts to this question. One is, had there been other instances of violence before this, um, and could you kind of, without giving too much away, because um, we want people to buy your book, uh, <laughs> what, what, ex what exactly happens? What is this event? In my story, in my book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so 
you asked first question was it an isolated incident no it was happening up and down the country it was happening in the north it was coming in the southwest happening in london it was happening and you, and you look at what's been fascinating for me is looking through the evidence of these they they the, the government divided the country into sectors and in each of these sectors they have a special section on the color bar and how many incidents there were and actually around the launston time my incident in september 1943 there was a kind of crescendo it was a groundswell as i say you know there were incidents happening all over but in my story um, my soldiers met they trained and the camps they were trained at in America they experienced racism and we know this because Walter White who was head of the NAACP at the time came in to investigate this case um, and they had a very um, a tricky time training and they they weren't used to it, it was a their company was a mix match there were some from the south and some from the north and I think the northern soldiers weren't used to it the southern soldiers were and it was this kind of dawning realization that this is what it was to be an American soldier um, when they were treated so differently and apparently that started at Washington DC where you know in the north they could travel together but then they got to Washington DC and then they were separated and that separation generally meant worse jobs, worse food and worse treatment you know and the, the least of their worries one of them said was just being racially abused you know um, verbally racial that was the word that was the least of their worries um, and my soldiers they had racism in the camp that they were trained at in Oklahoma they had racism when they went getting ready to come to Britain and then they came and then they came to Launceston I think 10 days after they got off their ship and the very first thing they were told the very first thing after this journey was that actually you're not allowed to go into town you don't have the correct dress shirts now it didn't affect the white soldiers who didn't have the dress shirts but my soldiers were told you know you can't go in and they just had enough I think they were they were feeling the tension that was stateside and they came over and they were surprised by the way they were welcomed and I think that might have encouraged them they certainly went into town um, and they the first night they went in was a Saturday night and they were boozing with British soldiers they were talking to civilians they were stood drinks and they went to a dance and there was some aggro at the dance some white MPs came and said you're not allowed to come into this dance so they were they were turfed out of this dance but I think that was really the final straw and then the night in question the Sunday night it was actually a uh, Battle of Britain day it was the third anniversary mm -hmm. of the Battle of Britain so people have been celebrating that day but that night they weren't celebrating in Launceston there was uh, the guys were coming into town anyway they were drinking and there was an incident that involved white soldiers and one of the guys stood up and he asked his soldiers said, will you stick together let's stick together and they said yes so they went up to camp and they armed themselves and they came back into town to confront the MPs who to their mind were just stopping them enjoying the R&R &R that they so richly deserved you know it's it's interesting um you give how, how many uh, people did Americans came to Europe in World War Two? I think it's, it's two million, three million, Chris. Something three, well, the, three million passed through by the end. Yeah, yeah by the end, and it, the the majority are young men, uh, and yeah. you you give them all high powered weapons, or the great majority of them. Yeah. Uh, and and stuff is 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 going to happen. So 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 there was a there was kind of the. Um, there was a uh, an in, we'll call it an incident okay to start with and, and I don't want to get into the press coverage yet because I want to save that for 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 when it happens in the story but um, uh, and there is definitely a, a shootout but it isn't this is not this and doesn't end up being a murderous shootout as it happens does it and a sh shootout sounds like there's people shooting at each other it's really just one group of guys maybe even one guy or a few guys actually doing the shooting right right and they were I mean the charges that were brought against them they were charged with attempted murder um, that was one of the charges and Walter White was just saying you know if they were attempting murder you wouldn't have shot two people below the knees that wasn't their aim and I don't think it was their aim I think they had just had enough of their treatment 
in the US Army and they were making a stand, actually. But it wasn't attempted murder and it was, as you say, a dangerous situation when everyone's armed, you know, they're all trained with weapons and how to use them. And I'm amazed, actually, it took that long to have this kind of incident, given they were here from 1942 this was towards the end of 1943. I'm surprised it took that long. Well, there was obviously a, a big case. I don't know whether you've heard in, in June that year, there was a shoot, a real shooting in Bamber Bridge and there was a fatality um, in the north. That's near Sh um, Bolton. Um, anyway, it's up north, the, um, the location of it. And that attracted huge coverage as well. But this was quite interesting. Interestingly, I'm in Bath, I'm researching something else, very similar time period. And I spoke to a 95 year old guy last week and he remembered the shooting actually. And he said, oh, I remember that. And we wondered what happened to these guys, right. um, which, is, which is interesting. I think that's gonna come onto your, your question about press, but it was, yeah, quite a big story at the time because it involved so many of them as well, so many soldiers. Well, one of the things that, that strikes me and having studied organizations, military organizations for my whole life is, where's this unit's officer? Where's the company commander saying, what are you doing? He, he I mean, for, for, first of all, if you could just tell us who he was and what he did or didn't do, but I just don't see him getting he involved. He doesn't make an appearance. He doesn't, yeah. he doesn't make an appearance. He wasn't even he was there. Busy that, he was busy that night. He was, yeah. he was, he was. He wasn't there that night, actually. He wasn't there, he was away. Um, I can't remember, he was a few miles away. He wasn't in the vicinity. The point is nobody really knew what was going on. The right. company commander had issued his edict saying they weren't to go out and make sure everyone knows about that. And that was the, that was the last they knew about it. The guy actually who was in charge, um, he, he was one of the white officers. This was a, a company that was run by white officers. Some later on in the war had um, African-American officers, but at this stage it was very much the white officers um, and the black soldiers. And actually in Bath as well, in the local um, company, they had the white soldiers in the house and the black soldiers were in the tent. So it was, the segregation ran all the way through and they weren't particularly well commanded. They certainly weren't respected and I don't think that the commanding officer commanded any respect himself. J James Basson? Yes. Is that that's yeah. his name? Yeah. I, I don't know how to, I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly. I mean because it does seem like, um, you know, and, and Chris you're, you're you've been very involved in telling the Band of Brothers story and Dick Winters who's the the company commander of Easy Company seems to know everything about what everybody's doing well, at that's every what I mean. moment. Yeah. yeah, so it seems like that that part of the breakdown here is the way the officers are treating this assignment. And I also, and I, I know yes. this isn't a question, yes. but, um, yeah. but, but I'll throw, I'll Kind of put it out to you. I also found it interesting. I mean, on the one hand, you you sort of painted in the book. You you paint a, 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 a I think a very suggestive picture that this some sort of conflict, whether it was involving these guys or some other guys, was almost inevitable given mm. the factors, the time, mm. the volatility, the social interactions. Um, uh, but at the same time, it's interesting that it happens to these guys because they'd only been there for four days, yeah. three or four right. days. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, but I think, again, they'd been through the training process. So the moment that they are enlisted, it starts this whole journey, this whole being treated so badly. So, and I just think they'd been in long enough. They'd been in since 42. Some had joined up as early as a February. And I think this was just that this was the final straw. And I think they came to a country where they were allowed to go drinking. They were allowed. One of them talks about his English girlfriend who's going down to see Barbara, his English girlfriend, down the pub. We'd only been there four days. We had an English girlfriend. <laughs> and I think well that done. was quite, you know, and they liked their gin um, and they liked the English beer. Uh, but yeah, it was a, the thing you say about the commanding officer, you say, and, and you're right, it was seen as a not a great job to be an officer in one of these companies. And I think the guy who allowed them, just said actually you're not allowed to have your passes signed, he was out in town with all his friends that night. 
And 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 I, I don't think it's actually giving anything away to to say that the the company commander. But by, by the time they get to the court martial, a few weeks later, he's he's already been removed from command. So yeah. Yeah. there's a there's a message right there. We do have a question yeah. from uh, from Brian Peacock, and um, and he says, well, where were the NCOs, the non commissioned officers, the corporals and the sergeants in this situation? Were were some of these soldiers involved in this yeah. incident? Uh, and yeah. where some of them were NCOs, weren't yeah. they? Yeah, two. There were two sergeants um, involved in this, which I think, and they, in the paperwork that's included in the court martial, they have these kind of evaluation of the soldiers involved. They're all bright guys, you know. They're clever guys. They, the one Clifford Barrett, um, who is the ringleader. He was said to be aggressive but bright. You know, they're bright fellows. Um, and yeah, the sergeants were involved, two of them, which made it, I think that's one of the reasons it captured so much attention, actually. It wasn't just, you know, the, the privates. It was, it was, you know, sergeants, young guys, bright, intelligent, had good, all of them had previous good behavior apart from two. And there were 14 who were put on trial. So it's quite... I think that says even more about just how awful their situation was and the plight that they were finding themselves in. So, so Kate, so you know, there's shots fired, people are wounded. Um, how soon does the trial happen, and kind of, you know, what what takes this from being an incident of soldiers in this little town to this becoming a court case, and, and how how quick does that process all kind of move yeah. forward? It's quick, it's very quick. So the um, court martial happens on October 15th, 16th and 17th. The shooting is the 26th of sep September. It's so it's always weeks. struck me, it's, yeah. it's quick. It's really quick. Um, it's like summary justice. It's, uh, the investigation period isn't very long. Um, the reason I think that they wanted to deal with that, I mean, they always dealt with these. From my, I'm looking at a few court martials. They always seem to happen very quickly after the incident. Um, I don't know that because it was a wartime situation, but it was happening very quickly. And yeah, so not a lot of time, but this caused a lot of press coverage. It was a story that the guys I've spoken to, I was lucky enough to speak to people who were young at the time and remembered it, and it was a huge story for them. For me, when I was first researching it, imagine my surprise when I'm looking in the newspapers, and it's actually every national newspaper, a lot of coverage. Um, the newspapers in the Second World War were, you know, a lot, there are a lot more newspapers. Everyone read the newspaper. It was the majority way that people got their news. And it was in every single newspaper, pages and pages, the front page of many of them. So that was a real surprise to me when I was investigating this story. I thought it was like one of my dad's stories. But when I got into it, it was a huge story and it was reported in American newspapers. They got the results of the trial um, quicker than the British papers. They got them out there. Um, it was all very interesting. It was a huge story that really captured the imagination. People were writing about it. Roy Otley commented on it. Um, he was writing about it. Walter White obviously came out to investigate himself. So it was a big deal at the time. And I wonder whether the fact that it was attracting so much attention was why, especially they needed to get it dealt with and out the way as quickly as possible. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we're talking with Kate Warren, who is the author of the book American Uprising in Second World War England and Mutiny in the Duchy. Uh, so we'll, there, and there's the, uh, the cover there if you're looking for that book. And uh, Kate, I wanted to say, you know, so we're, we're in and we're talking about the court martial, but we do have a question here and I want to, we always like to uh, try to get our audience questions uh, involved here. This is a question that I had on my list too for later, but we'll bring it in now. Uh, Skip Cornett asks, did you have any contact with anyone involved in this event? And I guess even anybody who lived in the town at the time, I mean, it. You know, it's a long time ago, but but did you have any personal uh, interviews or or um, sort of interaction to try to get this story? 
With the so the Cornish side of things was quite straightforward actually. There was a wonderful woman called Joan Rendell who was a local historian and she was a young twenty year old at the time. She was in the town square at the time this happened. And she you know, I was lucky enough she died very sadly in a fire about ten years ago. Um, but I was lucky enough to have lots of interview time with her and she was very generous with her resources and her pictures. So she was the person actually I first spoke to about the incident and she really uh, got me going on the right direction. In terms of the soldiers involved, to my last immigrant, no, I haven't been able to trace any of the relatives and I would love to and I'm really hoping that somehow through my book I'll be able to reach out and find their stories because I want them to know that I wanted their story to be told because I think it should be told. Um, so to my lasting sadness, I haven't been able to contact any of their families. I think it's complicated because there was a great migration at the time. Some of the guys from the south wouldn't have returned south, they'd have gone north. There was It was a lot of transience and flux and migration and movement. So no, I didn't get to track them down and I'd absolutely love to do that. So, um, so okay, well, I want to get to uh, Marie's question here in a second, but you mentioned that there's... Um, Lots and lots of coverage in England. Um, yes, there's coverage in the states, and obviously there's a there's a black, a very active African American press. Yes. Um, so I'm curious what the different publications are saying. I mean, so what are British publications saying? What's the African American press saying? Is is the just the general American press saying anything about this? I mean, what's kind of what's going on? The African American press, so let's compare. So the Mirror, the Daily Mirror, you live in Britain now. So the Daily yeah. Mirror, there was a newspaper at the time called the Herald, and the Herald actually was sold and became the Sun. But at the time in the Second World War, it was a campaigning sort of socialist, left-leaning newspaper, and they really championed the rights and the the cause of the African-American soldiers, actually. Um, and it was very clear from the way they wrote this story. There were editorials, there were letters to newspapers saying, this isn't fair, this isn't how we do them. And it was very interesting, the whole subject. People would write in to the Times. There was a, a really lovely letter to the Times from someone saying that they'd been to a restaurant and they'd seen a black soldier who had a letter with him saying, please serve this soldier. And they're like, why are we treating soldiers like this? Well, of course we're going to serve them. So there was in the newspapers, the British newspapers, the tab, well, that we call them tabloids now, but the, the Mirror, the Express, they were very much championing the rights of African-American soldiers. And I think when um, various senior American soldiers came to, to the country, they were often asked about it in press conferences about the, the, the racial tension and they would, the British press would cover that. With the African American press, they told it as it was actually, so the shooting story is covered in an American, um, in the Chicago Defender um, and as a result of his coverage, David Oro was the writer, he was taken off the case. He had his press pass revoked for reporting this story. He told it how it was. Some of the details aren't quite right, how many people were involved, and the same Royal Otley, some of the actual details slightly wrong. But the tone actually, there's not a lot of difference in tone between the African American press and the British press. In the American papers I've seen, they're just quite straight. You know, the soldiers have been charged, the soldiers have been sentenced, the court martials happened with less of the sort of colour and the detail. But it was, it was, the coverage is really, of this story was brilliant. I felt I could really get a sense of what the courtroom was like, what the atmosphere was like, simply because there was so much column inches devoted to this. I had the transcript on one hand and then I had the stories from all these different sources and I could build up a really interesting picture. But it was a big story and it was co covered in detail by many different reporters, you know, from all over the country. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, a couple of questions here. We, we have a question from Doug McCord about the picture that appears on the book cover. And I'll, I'll bring the picture up here because I, I did uh, 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 bring that in and it's this picture. Mm. And Doug asks, um, he wants to know if this is the trial uh, because he says the photo on the book cover appears to show that men as segregated. Was that photo taken at the court martial? 
This photo here that we're looking at now right. is um, taken at Bodmin Barracks, actually, in 1944, and it was taken by George Ellis. So it's not to do with the trial. It's not to do with my men. It's not to do with the trial. There is actually a picture of my soldiers in the book so that was that on the front moment. page. Yeah. Yeah, that's on the front page of the Herald. On but the these third are day segregated. The these, this, They're this is... absolutely segregated by this wonderful photographer, George Ellis, London-based photographer, happened to move to Cornwall in 1939. And he takes these great pictures of Cornwall during the war. And for me, when I saw this picture, which is held by Cress and Kerno, the Cornish archives, it just struck a chord. He is selling us so much with this this picture it's so poignant and there are a couple of pictures like this um, that he's taken but he's making the point this segregation you can see that line is a rigid line of separation between the two soldiers isn't it and you can see that yeah it absolutely Chris you want to go ahead well, I was, I'll bring I some know, other questions so oh. one of the uh, no say so one of the other questions that we had um, and I'm gonna if I uh, hopefully not mess this up here we go yep so uh, Marie uh, Jacob wants to know, can you tell us ultimately what happened to those who were court-martialed? So, obviously, yeah. I, I don't see too many acquittals in their future. Uh, no. So, <laughs> no. Um, no. It's so interesting. Happened, yeah, do you want me to just say, so what happened to the guys? So, after a three-day court-martial, they were all found guilty, surprise, surprise, and they were all given sentences of between 15 and 20 years hard labor. Wow. Um, and I, you know, I, we have a, and we're, we're sorry, it feels like machine gun time here that we're, we keep uh, popping different questions at you. But we had another uh, a comment really, but it, it does lead to a question uh, as well. Um, uh, uh, Kathy Hurst says, you know, uh, I, I can see a little Googling uh, behind this question, that there were 1.7 million courts martial mm. during World War II. Sounds like they couldn't have spent a lot of time prepping one prepping any single one and so clearly reading uh, the book there is a sense especially with the defense that it's kind of hasty in the in the oh. preparation but I also wonder just to bring in a kind of a, a, a sort of a different question to add to that um, if these were white soldiers would it have been that different and maybe yes is the answer or maybe no but I mean they did open as some soldiers whether or not it's the actual defendants because there's some question about that some yeah. soldiers did open fire uh, yep. uh, on MPs in the town that's clearly going to be a court-martial offense how do you yep. think it would have been different uh, what, what can you tell us about the court-martial um, and sort of the speed of it and how do you think it might have been different had it been white soldiers there's a lot for you to chew on there but i'll give you a shot at that yeah i mean it's just what i find quite interesting is the african-american soldiers were a tenth of the u.s army and yet there's a very sad statistic that those found guilty and executed as a result of court martials they were majority black soldiers even though they were a minority of soldiers they were the majority of people who were punished so yeah i do think that white soldiers would have been found guilty. I don't think they'd have had the same sentences. I don't think as many would have been charged. I think maybe two, I think the people firing. I mean, literally, if you read the book, there is so much misidentification going on here. There is no sense that any of the guys really were really there. There are a couple of, you know, Clifford Barrett was clearly there. Clifford Barrett clearly was a ringleader. He was the son, I mean, what I found so sad, he was the son of a World War I veteran. And his mum mm. writes this very sad note saying, you know, he was lost after the death of his dad, died early, you know, came back from the war, died. It's a very sad, sad story. So I feel, you know, you could go and analyze, you know, why he felt that he had to take this stand. Yes, so the white soldiers would have been punished. Yes, they wouldn't have been punished as severely. There wouldn't have been as many. And I do think, there would have been a better defense. I think I think they would have had a, de a better defense, definitely. One guy, he hadn't even seen what he was meant to have said and it was presented as his statement. I, I've had some, some feedback on the structuring of my book. So I've structured the book as I would a film, actually. I start on day one of the court martial. I use it as a skeleton to tell the story. So sure. day one 
is the beginning of the book and then I go back to explain how they got there. Then I go through with the court martial and then I say what happens at the end. And the reason I structured it like that is I thought it was so predictable actually. If you just, it's a straight trajectory of them joining the army to then what happens, it was just so predictable. And I wanted people to get a sense because I don't feel I should be judging. I feel that people should read the story and make their own minds up. But I just wanted that sense, this is the evidence that these guys were convicted on. There was very little evidence to convict all 14 of those men, young men, to 15 to 20 years hard labour, I think. And I wanted people to get a sense of, this is what someone was saying. This is, you know, go through and see, make up your own mind. Would you have convicted someone on that basis? I don't think many people would, or certainly not all of them. Well, did, Kate, did they, did they all end up serving their full sentences, do you know? No, they came, I think they came, um, they, 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 ple they made pleas for clemency every six months afterwards. And from 1946 onwards, they began to be released. Mm -hmm. So they didn't serve 15 to 20 year sentences, but they were certainly very harsh at the time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, there's, there's a, um, a, another comment. I don't, I don't, I don't think this was actually in your book. I have to say that, um, that, Chris, Chris knew all about Roy Otley. I did not. So one of the results of reading your book was that I bought uh, his book, uh, well, his diary, his, uh, mm. his uh, World War II diary book. Uh, one of the things he said there is talking to a soldier on the crossing uh, the Atlantic who said to him, you can't make a first-class soldier out of a second-class citizen. And I mean, ultimately, that's kind of uh, a little bit of the heart of what's involved here, isn't mm. it? It's the conflict between treating people as second-class citizens at home, but then expecting them to be um, yeah. acting differently suddenly in this situation. So sad. Have you heard of Linda Have You? She's written a book called Forgotten. It's about a barrage balloon company mm -hmm. who were there on D-Day. And it really makes me sad. She went to go and interview these guys. She tracked them down. And they just said, we've always been waiting for someone to knock on our door and, you know, and just mm -hmm. recognize what we did. And I think our view of history of the Second World War is very white. It's a very white view. And you look back at it and you don't really think about it until you just, it's just time for us to look at stuff with new eyes, with fresh eyes. We've got the history behind us. We've got the ability to reread. There's lots of more documents, even still they're being released. And it's time just to look at it and just, you know, as you say, the Roy Otley writing, isn't he a wonderful writer? I've never heard of him, but what a fantastic writer he is. Why don't we know about him? So much of these, the writing, I love, I'm a journalist. I trained as a journalist. I love the writing of the Second World War. I love, they're so pithy. You know, what George Orwell, it's all these brilliant writers. Um, and just to have someone like that, I've never heard of him. I thought, God, why haven't I? Why don't they reprint his books? They're brilliant. And he's, he's so to the point, isn't he? And he, he says, I think another comment he makes is what made him very sad is that German prisoners of war later on were allowed to eat in the restaurants, whereas sure. the black soldiers are being, you know, shoved around the back into the kitchens. It's, well, it's yeah. Well, and I, and I wonder, Kate, and I don't quite know how to ask this, so I'll kind of blunder it out there, if you will. <laughs> um, Americans who know something of our history know about segregation and know about sort of the some of the sadder chapters maybe don't know as much as they should but at least have a, a, a sense of it mm. and I wondered if it was if did you feel as you wrote this story that you were suddenly kind of learning about stuff or realizing mm, mm. sort of stuff to a degree that you had never known before? Yeah, totally. It was a whole new, the fact that I was interested because I'm a little girl who loves history and my dad, I've touched a bullet hole and I thought, why is there a bullet hole? I want to find out. But the whole, there are so many layers that make this story interesting. It's how Britain reacted to this segregated army. I'm of a generation, I remember how, you know, growing up in the 1980s, awful racism, awful words used, awful violence, very divided times that we lived in. I remember that. 
And so for, for, to find out that kind of our grandparents were very warm and welcoming to African-Americans who came to this country, that shocked, you know, I was surprised, frankly, um, and quite, you know, it was a nice thing to find about. Someone else I spoke to said often, history, you know, things that you learn about in history aren't great, but sometimes it's very rare to get something nice, you know, something pleasant. So that was... That was quite interesting. In terms of me and saying, no, I didn't know much about that. So I didn't even know, it was a, as I said, I didn't know it was a segregated army. And that was a realization for me. And it's something I didn't know about. And I, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I didn't know about that, about studying the Second World War. I don't think I was aware that it was segregated. I certainly didn't know about the supply side of things. Um, and that's where, you know, there were, there were fighters. I just presumed that everyone was fighting on the same sort of basis. I didn't know it. So it was, so, yeah, it's a learning for me. So, okay, I, I don't want to get, you know, too far out, off track here, but one of the things that you talk about in the book is that um, the, obviously the, the reaction of the British public is overwhelmingly positive to African Americans. Um, you have some mentions of people in the British government that are going, how are we going to deal with this? This is going to be tough mm. because we have our own system and the Americans are coming with mm. their system. Um, but one of the things I'm curious about is the British don't exactly have a squeaky clean record when it no. comes to, and no. so, you know, you've got, there are, um, there's the West Indian Regiment, for example, yeah. all blacks who volunteer to serve the crown and yeah. General, General Alexander, who's desperate for troops in Italy says, I don't want them here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so is there, does any, not the people in the villages because that's, that's, that's the difference that's the right. difference that is the difference i think that's the difference so you have these you know these extraordinary cabinet discussions about the african-americans coming and right. i think it's eden who says oh they won't like the climate and you know it's just right. preposterous but you get the people and i think that's what for me and you get that they're the people who are being interviewed by mass observation they're the people who are reported by um so harry haig who was head of southern command there's no reason for him to sugarcoat what people are saying but he right. could he was picking up what people were saying and you know it ended up this mass demonstration on the street with a black sergeant saying we ain't no slaves this is England so I think there's a real interesting divide that you pick up I'm sure that the establishment you know I'm sure they had felt very differently to the normal British people who were working in factories who were going to the pub they were the people who were standing the drinks the soldiers certainly were drinking out with the guys in Launceston they would stand them round so if someone refused to serve them because the white GIs went to them when they came in the pub a British soldier would go and stand them up and I think it's really important we're, we weren't divided by race at the time we were divided by class and I think there'll right. be a different reaction from those different strata yeah, I just, I, you know, one of those little moments of time that I'd love to be a fly on the wall is you talk about um, some of the pubs that say British and, and Negro soldiers only. Yeah. I would love to be a fly on the wall when some white American <laughs> soldiers saw that sign. <laughs> that would have been an interesting moment. But oh. no, I mean, it's just interesting how, you know, yeah. I don't know. Oh, sorry, Rick. Go ahead. Well, we think no, we're the same no. we, because we speak the same. This is for me that the other you said, what did I learn? You think we speak the same language. It should be so easy for, you know, the British and the Americans to get on. But there was a real sense of difference as well. That was also surprising. You know, some of the reactions I've been, you know, I'm I'm was brought up in an age where, you know, the Second World War was always on drama. It was always on television. It was always, you know, it's always been in our consciousness. People have always been talking about it. And it was always like a very benign, happy, rose-tinted look at allied relations. And actually, there was a lot of shade there. There was a lot of niggles. And, you know, people felt, you know, Orwell called it an occupied, you know, country. And for some people, I think it felt like that. And, you know, I was reading some of the comments of children saying, you know, got any gum chum? We all know they said, got any gum chum? And then actually they were regarded by many GIs as beggars, saying, why are the British parents sending their children out to beg on the streets? It's, um, that was very interesting. You said, you said about, you know, what was I learning about? That was also a learning curve for me as well. And also just reading the British press and all the other things that were going on, you know, the looting during bombing, the petty theft, the, frankly, sexual assaults that was happening, you know, women had a pretty rough time, frankly, um, in the war. And all of that was swept under the carpet as well in the, in the name of good sort of morale and allied relations. And a lot was blamed on women, I think, for, for a lot of trouble. 
Yeah. Well, the, the phrase that, that has come to my mind to, uh, lately um, is the, you know, history is what we choose to remember. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, there's been a, a lot of time period where we've chosen to remember only the, the positive aspects. And, and certain people have, you know, gone to great effort and done great research to point out, you know, that everything isn't quite uh, on that level. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask a question, um, uh, you know, about the high level people that we think of in England. Uh, so Eisenhower's not there in England at this time. He's not yeah. going to get there till he's off in, uh, in uh, uh, um, he's in Italy, I guess, yeah. uh, at the moment. Uh, mm. So he's not going to get there. But uh, Jake Devers is the head of, of Shafe at that time. Of course, Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of England. Is there do are high level people aware of what's going on in this uh, situation in this court martial? And did they leave any record of it? No, I mean Churchill was definitely referring to it when he says, you know, it caused grave trouble. Everyone was talking about. It. I'm actually reading um, the book by Butcher on Eisenhower, you know, my, my time at Eisenhower now, and I was just reading through for stuff. And in 1942, they were talking about the Negro question is what they described it as. Um, definitely Churchill was aware of it. He wrote to his cousin, the Duke of Marlborough, who had some role with the American, you know, sort of liaison between the Americans um, and the British. And he was sort of betraying his own sort of prejudice and worrying about it. And Churchill said, go and investigate it. It was all kind of talked about, definitely. And Churchill absolutely referred to this this case. What else would he be referring to when he was asking what do sort of black soldiers do? What are their R and R provisions? He talked about it. So yeah, I think they knew about it. I think everyone knew about it. Um, it just depends, you know, how they could deal with it and what they had to do. It was just it was tricky. It was tricky. There was a sort of an education. The British were meant to be educated about how to deal with it. And Sir Harry Haig said, it's just, they get that, but they just don't like the bullying. They feel it's not fair. And that's what the British reaction kind of was. Just on the streets, as we were talking about, you know, the different reactions, but on the streets, you know, saw people coming out of the pub and being, you know, kicked off the pavement. They didn't like that. So, okay, what do you think, now, depending on which source you read, before World War II, there were somewhere between, what, 8,000 and 15,000 blacks that live in Great Britain and yeah. mostly they're in London or Liverpool or Port City. So yeah, people yeah. in small villages like where your family have never even seen a black person. Yeah. And all of a sudden thousands of these African Americans come. Mm. Um, what do you think, how did that affect their impression of, of different races and minorities? And because of course after the war, yeah, Br Britain changes dramatically. Absolutely. Yeah. Does the presence of these young African Americans have an impact on how they Britons view the world? Do you think? Or? I don't know. Just really interesting. I don't know. I was talking to a lovely old guy, another lovely old boy who lives in um, South Stoke, mm -hmm. this lovely village in Bath, and he was saying um, they had there was a black camp outside, and his grandfather used to run the pub, and his grandfather used to send beer up to the camp for them. You know, this old bloke, he was, you know, in his 80s or whatever in 1943. So he was, you know, he'd lived through different times. And um, I just said, what well, I said to him, what was he like with the African American? And he said he was a lovely old guy. They were nice, polite boys. They were never caused any trouble. He said, I really liked them. So I think my mum actually, so she was born between, um, in a place between Bath and Bristol. She remembers black servicemen coming to, to tea in their house. I don't know. Their lasting impression, I don't know. I couldn't answer that. Yeah. My, my sort of interest, what I'd like to know is how many people involved in the civil rights movement had World War II experience and how did that affect them? That's what I'd kind of like to know. If I was doing a, a dissertation or a thesis or something, I'd quite like to explore that. Well, I think a lot, I, you know, I think a lot of the civil rights veterans, initial ones, had, certainly had served during the war. Mm. Well, and we talked about uh, this a, a few weeks ago, but I mean, there were one out of ten American soldiers in World War One was African American, and some of those Gosh. people were involved in the civil rights movement, the long civil mm. rights movement prior to World War Two. 
we're, we're almost at the end, and I, I don't have a big, you know, incredibly deep and philosophical wrap-up question. But I do. Uh, we have one more question from the audience instead uh, uh, to do which that is much for better. you, which is much better. Uh, and Ted Moon uh, wants to know. Uh, did any of the soldiers, and not not obviously the 14 who were sent back uh, uh, on hard labor, do we know if any of the African American soldiers decided to end up staying in the UK? Is that something that we know anything about? I don't. Do you know what I don't know? There's a book called. So I've had quite a few people get in touch with me afterwards. There were certainly a lot of children left behind at the end of the Second yeah. World War, and I was doing a Q and A um, with a group. Happen? Yeah. Well, wow. <laughs> um, and she was saying that at her generation in school there were five black children and she said we just didn't treat them any differently it was just just part of the, the going to school they were just in our class there was nothing was said about it they were just treated normally I don't know there was a book that someone recommended I read by Neville Shute called The Checkerboard and it's about just that it's about a soldier an African-American soldier who falls in love goes back to America can't live without her comes back and lives in Cornwall actually um, so I don't know I'd like to know that there's certainly um, grandchildren and children of African-American GIs I'm not I don't know of any who decided to stay they weren't allowed there are a lot of cases of people who wanted to get married and weren't allowed to get married their commanding officers would refuse them permission to get married um, I know about that but I don't know anyone who stayed in this country anyway I don't know well, it's a very interesting is, question there is an association I don't know the name of it but it, of children of GIs yeah GI trace to, okay yeah yeah and they try to help yeah. help them yeah Oh, There's some lovely stories there, actually. Really nice stories. Yeah. Kate Warren, thank you so much for joining us today. This has just thank been you. a fascinating conversation. And I want to remind everybody that your book is called An American Uprising in Second World War England. And, uh, you know, you've helped us to, uh, to examine a part of World War II that we don't usually talk about. And we're so grateful that you came on today. Thank you for having me. It's been lovely. It's been really, Great. really good. And can I wish you a really happy Christmas after this year? Nice time for a break. A safe, well. insane Christmas yeah. and bring yeah. on 2021 oh, as soon as you get can. Get rid of 2020. Get over <laughs> so That's right. All right. Thank you very much. It's been lovely. Bye -bye. Thank you. All right. Well, Mr. Anderson. Um, yes, Mr. Mr. Byer, yes, that's my that's, name. Is that who you are? That is my name. Oh, sorry. It's written right on the screen. I, I know you're trying to be anonymous Damn, there, but I uh, but I um, I'm outing you. I want to remind our our audience uh, and you because I don't want you to get confused by this. And that, I'm easily confused. That that this is our last show of 2020. Oh, does that mean the virus is over? We can all go out and have fun? Not exactly. Oh. Um, but our, uh, we are, uh, we, after 40 shows, we're allowing ourselves a week off, and we hope we don't lose the entire audience. We do hope that some of you will come back uh, on January 3rd for what I think will be a very fun show. We're going to focus on war movies, and as you know, we mentioned it last week, but we're inviting anybody who wishes to to email us at hhh at stephenambrosetours.com and tell us what your favorite war movie is and why. And from the people who email us, we're going to select the select few um, oh. uh, and, um, and invite people on the show to explain why. And we'll reward the people who we invite on the show to talk about their war movie briefly, because I think there'll be enough people to be moving through pretty fast. Uh, we'll reward the people who come on the show with a with a Stephen Ambrose tours swag bag. And did you did you describe did you lay out the ground rules though? Well, there there are two film projects that are not eligible, and I have to say nobody has picked those so far. <laughs> well, that probably is in good the though. entry, so it's not a terrible <laughs> problem. But Chris, what are the two film related projects that are not eligible? Uh, the Ghost Army and the Band of Brothers yeah. are not eligible. We've talked enough about those this yes. year for both of us. So, uh, but please do email us and tell us uh, that email that email address again: hhh at stephenambrosetours dot com. Buy uh, today. Uh, supplies are limited. See stores for details. And so. Um, <laughs> 
uh, absolutely. And meantime, to everybody out there, oh my gosh, thank you for being with us for 40 yeah. weeks. We have, you've made our pandemic better. Guys, you've helped me get through this awful mess. So God bless. Same Stay here. safe. Stay safe. Have a wonderful holiday, however you celebrate it. We really appreciate your being with us. See you next year. Yeah.